Major funding for this program is made possible by grants from Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Inc., New York's Window Company, New York Community Bank, Capital One Bank, Greenberg Traurig, LLP. Additional funding is provided by grants from Akron Gold Brothers, LLC, Briarwood Organization, C.B. Richard Ellis, Cushman and Wakefield, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Friedman, LLP, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, M&T Bank, Must Development, LLC, Des Moines Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Orphanides and Associates, SJP Properties, Sterling and Sterling, Stonehenge Partners, Urban American, W Financial Mortgage Fund, the Wickoff Group. Hello, my name is Michael Stoller. New York City has a great number of people, many people who are in poverty and many people who need housing and food and a variety of things. And today I'm very fortunate to have the CEO uh, of the Met Council on Jewish Poverty, Willie Rapfogel. Thanks, Michael. How are you? So, Willie, you know, in January you're going to be 55 years of age. Uh, you were born on the Lower East Side, and you continue to live on the Lower East Side, right? You surprise everybody by staying alive. You're staying alive. No, you've, do, you've done a great job over there. Um, so you were born 55 years ago at Beth Israel, right? At Beth Israel. And what, what did you, your late dad do? Uh, he was a uh, government employee all his life. He, at the time when I was born, he worked for the Army on Governor's Island, subsequently come to work for New York City. So when you were a youth, you went to yeshiva, right? Right. I went to a couple of yeshivas. Uh, one was known as Chassam Sofer on the Lower East Side, and the other Rabbi Jacob Joseph School. So what happened? You left the uh, yeshiva, you, you went to Brooklyn College, you, and you left the borough. I left the borough. You Very rare borough. occasion. Of so, so what were you doing at Brooklyn College? I uh, majored in journalism, actually, and had a great professor, Bruce Porter. If he's still around and watching this, uh, I give him a shout out, and really learned a lot about English journalism and many other things. Also learned enough to know that at that time I couldn't become a regular journalist because I was Sabbath observant. So my wife and I took our wedding money. But wait, let's before we sure. get to your wife, we have to tell you tell the story. How you, I mean, Judy is going to be upset. Now, when you were going to Brooklyn College, you were going to something called Cafe Maccabee. Maccabee, which was a program of the Education Alliance, and that's where my wife and I first met. So you get married, and you and Judy take the wedding gifts and. And Mr. Rapfogel over here the, decides that he's going to create a newspaper? Yes. A we, Jewish muckracking newspaper? We decided that we weren't satisfied with the Jewish journalism at the time, and we decided you needed a muckraking Jewish newspaper that would examine the scandals in the nursing home business, that would look at the Diamond District and see what was going on there, that would look at the JDL for what was going on behind the scenes and not what people were reading about. How long did that last? It lasted almost four years. Um, we actually, using the newspaper, were able to profile lots of elected officials and people like Ed Koch, who was somebody that we endorsed very early on in the 1977 mayoral campaign, and we became very friendly with Ed. So the, the newspaper is the demise, and what happens? You go to... Uh... I end up going to work for Ed Koch, who had actually offered me a job while I was still at the newspaper. I said, no, I love the newspaper. I'm going to keep doing this forever. And sure enough, the newspaper goes under, and here I come to City Hall. And they were very gracious. They, uh, they brought me on board to work on revenue projects to enhance city parking budget. Parking tickets, right? Well, among them the was parking tickets so that we would have less handwriting errors. We were able to create more checkoff boxes. We also did a management information system for the city that tracked the police department and traffic agents 
by the summonses they wrote. So you could tell which ones were writing good summonses, which were writing bad summonses, and could counsel those who were writing bad summonses. And revenue increased dramatically. Now, you spent a number of years with Ed, Ed and then you got involved with Jay Golden. Right. Uh, the city controller at the time, Jay Golden, uh, is where I worked for about seven years. Did a number of things with Jay, including working on board of estimate issues, which is the now defunct uh, system, was the bicameral part of the legislature in New York City, the Board of Estimate, made up of the mayor, the council president, the controller, and the five borough presidents, was the upper house to the city council lower house. Um, I also would end up running the division of real property for the controller's office. That dealt with things like uh, real estate taxes. It dealt with certiorari, certiorari issues and a whole host of other things. So after you spent seven years with Jay, and you followed Jay because he was involved with the American Jewish Congress. Right. Jay had become the regional president of the American Jewish Congress here in the metropolitan area, and he asked me to step in and become the executive director for the American Jewish Congress for the regional. Now, prior to that, I think, in between the, the, the newspaper, you had worked for Educational Alliance, right? Actually, before the newspaper is when I worked for Education Alliance and helped create this Cafe Maccabea, which was something that was for troubled, or what we would call today, at-risk youth kids who were hanging out on the streets, some of whom were taking uh, drugs and getting drunk on alcohol, and uh, unfortunately, their parents weren't watching out for them, and we were able to convince the Education Alliance to open its doors on Saturday nights and Sunday nights, which were the nights that they would get into trouble, and bring them in, create an environment where they'd have food, some entertainment and music, uh, pool hall and ping pong and things like that. Which is interesting because from the youth, you, you, you later on you take care of the elderly. Right. So. Um, you're in American Jewish Congress for how many years? About three? It's American Jewish Congress for about three years. And um, we were able to do some very interesting things there together with Jay. Um, he would subsequently go on to run for mayor. And about uh, shortly before that, I left to join the Orthodox Union's Institute for Public Affairs, which was newly created and which was really to help put the Orthodox Union um, really in Washington, D.C. as, as an organization that needed to be reckoned with. So now it's 1992, and, you know, you're, you're at the OU. You say it's time for a career path. What happens? Menachem Lubinsky and Rabbi David Cohn meet you? They, they come and um, talk to me about the possibility of coming to the Metropolitan Council on Jewish Property and taking over as executive director. Rabbi Cohn was talking about moving on and spending some more time in Israel. And um, they convinced me, in spite of the fact that I have to say the, the OU job was something that was very heady, spent two or three days a week in Washington, constantly running in and out of the White House and meetings at the Capitol. Uh, but they, they really got to me with the tachlis, which means just the reality of the Met Council position. Let's talk about the origins of Met Council. Met Council was founded in 1972. 72. And what was the mission in 1972? Back in 1972, the country was really absorbed in the war on poverty. And in New York City, there were a lot of neighborhoods, South Bronx, the Lower East Side, East New York, and a couple of other communities, where there were a lot of elderly Jews who kind of remained after the rest of the Jewish community left. And there was a groundswell of grassroots leadership that was saying, we need to begin to care for that community. And so together with the then Federation of Jewish Philanthropies, before it merged with UJA, um, these grassroots leaders helped create the Metropolitan Council on Jewish Property. Now, the interesting thing, and I want to show my audience, is that Met Council does not only take care of the Jewish people. Correct. It takes care of more than 100,000 people in New York of all nationalities, Absolutely. denominations, and everything. Now, how, now Met Council has uh, food kitchens, it has a food program, it has other programs. Let's talk about some of the housing of Met Council. I think the first housing took place in the early 80s, right? Uh, we actually started a program in the Bronx called Aishel, which was a residence for women who were victims of domestic violence. And it was a six-unit housing uh, project. And that was the real initiation of Met Council's housing. Uh, subsequent to that, in about 93, we created 120 units of senior housing through the HUD program for elderly housing up in Co-op City. So let's talk about that, because th this was a major uh, program. I mean, there was a, there was a need. Co-op City had some extra land. How did Met Council work with the land and you know, build this housing? Well, we were housing. fortunate we were able to go to the city, and at the time, uh, Freddie Ferrer was the borough president of the Bronx, was a huge supporter of this, recognized the need for senior housing. And by the way, when we built that 128 units, we had over 5,000 eligible applicants. Now, the 128 who would end up living there are chosen by lottery. 
but uh, the need is so I'd dramatic. Like you, I'd like you to explain the lottery because I, I feel, as I told you when we met, the lottery, I've always emphasized this, and, I, and I'd like my audience to understand how people who are elderly, over 62, qualify for the lottery all over the city, for sure. the Met Council, because if, if someone goes to the Met Council website, they have the opportunity, which is great, that you list all of the projects you have. You also list how to file for an application and if this program has opportunities because there's a shorter waiting list. Let's talk about the lottery sure. for a second. Sure. Uh, each of the housing programs may have different income levels that some of these are eligible for. So, for example, the HUD-202 program, which our co-op city project and which our projects in Starrett City are, um, is essentially for seniors um, who a one senior household is approximately about 19,000 or below in income, and a two senior household is about 24,000 or below in income is the income eligibility. They then file an application. We do a lot of marketing, advertising newspapers across the board, uh, all kinds of ethnic newspapers, everybody's eligible for this, and then the applications begin pouring in. And the sad thing about it is when you start to receive thousands of applications and oh, that only 128 or 100 are going to get into that particular building. But then you have the actual lottery and working with people from HUD or other government agencies, you actually begin picking out the applications. And the la applications get logged in. Those people who come out first, second, third are approached if they're interested. You know, the biggest problem that I remember in the applications is if your income is one dollar too low or one dollar too high, you can be thrown out of the application process. Right, right. It, the, the sad thing about this is that for many, in many cases, the working poor or the near poor find themselves just above the level of eligibility. We had a situation in a different project where somebody was eligible when they applied. The project, because of bureaucracy, government bureaucracy, was delayed, and then when the actual selection took place, the woman was not eligible because she had an increase in her Social Security, which put her above the dollar level. The government does not want to hear that this person really needs the housing or that she was eligible when the process began. They simply would not let us accept it. Now, what happens to someone who, as I, I proverbial say, wins the lottery? they can be in that apartment for the rest of their life. That's correct. correct. In fact, the intention is, unless they become extremely incapacitated and have to go into a nursing home, we do everything we can to make sure they're comfortable in that apartment, including as people age in place, providing them with home care, bringing them meals on wheels, making sure they have companionship there. So if somebody were to become disabled but would still have the use of their faculties and uh, able to live a decent quality of life there, we will make sure that they're comfortable in that apartment. Okay, so there was Co-op co City, then you went to Starrett City later right. on. We found some sites in Starrett City. Uh, we applied through HUD. HUD gave us the, uh, the, the winning grant to build the housing in Starrett City, and we built the project. A couple of years later, there was another HUD request for a proposal, and we saw that we could get land in Starrett City, but we couldn't find other land. We went back to HUD, and they said, you guys got to be kidding. And we said, no, no, we're not kidding. This is where we can get land. Don't you want us to build more housing? By the way, we could be more efficient here because we don't have to hire a second site director. We could hire more people like social workers and health care workers to take better care of the seniors there. They said, but wait a second, it's the same congressional district. We don't want to do too many things in the same congressional district. We said, what can we do to make you comfortable with this? They said, well, if you go to every member of Congress in the New York City delegation and they sign a letter to HUD that says, we're okay with this being in the same congressional district, we'll let you have it. And sure enough, we did. We got all the members to sign, and we were able to get it approved. We would do that one more time, and they made it a little bit more difficult by asking us to get the two U.S. senators to agree to sign the letter, which we did. You know, you talk about senators. We'll get back to housing. Sure. Interesting. As you said, with the OU, you spend three days a week in Washington and so on. You were talking to me about President Clinton and the interesting event one time and he said, what was the story about Jewish poverty? Sure. In, in March of 1992, right before the Democratic primary in New York State, there was a meeting with about 20 Jewish leaders and uh, then-Governor Bill Clinton, uh, who was running for the New York primary for president. And as we went around the table introducing ourselves, I had just started this job and mentioned Metropolitan Council on Jewish Poverty. And he kind of got startled and said, Jewish poverty? I come to New York because of Jewish wealth. And he said, tell me more. And I gave him some of the statistics and some of the information about what we did. 
and he was just staggered. I mean, afterwards, as we you know made some small talk, he said he just wants to hear more and keep in touch. And we were able to, over his eight years as president, talk about that and a host of other things, especially his weight. He liked to talk about his weight. Now, what about Bush? Uh, Bush was also fascinating. Um, we had the opportunity to meet on a number of occasions. He talked about our work in his speeches, and he and the First Lady, Laura Bush, uh, for six years in a row, sent us $1,000 a year personal uh, checks because they believe, particularly in our food pantry program, uh, they love the concept that we've used hundreds of volunteers who would help us package and distribute uh, food to 10,000 to 12,000 families every single month. Let's explain that program. Sure. We, we have a, uh, probably the largest kosher food pantry in the United States uh, where we take uh, tons of non-perishable food, break it up into packages, and using volunteers for the most part to do that, then distribute it to 40 local pantries that we have around the city. You don't have to be Jewish or kosher to get the kosher food pantry help, but we simply want to make it available to those people who are kosher. How do you know if they, qu they qualify to get the food? Well, most of the people who come to the food pantries are referred by other social service agencies, government agencies, government officials, um, having said that, when somebody comes, if they're not referred by somebody, they're not turned away either. If somebody's going to stand online to get food from a food pantry, we're not going to turn you away. But the vast majority, 99% of the clients who come there are referred. Let's fast forward because to the city, inclusionary housing. Um, people, you know, inclusionary housing, if you build this affordable housing for seniors over 62 or and a member could be 55, a uh, developer is afforded the opportunity to build a higher a, a building at a higher uh, location. The first inclusionary housing was on 23rd Street, right? right? We did a project on 23rd Street with Glenwood. There's about 19 units there, and it's 23rd Street between 3rd and Lexington Avenue. And uh, we became sold on this inclusionary program process because, number one, we would get $5,000 eligible applicants for 100 units of senior housing when we did the HUD-202 program. We wanted to find a way. We were driven to find a way to do more housing for senior citizens. And when you see the seniors who move in to any of the senior housing, they look like they won the lottery. I mean, they're often moving from hey, substandard housing. I've been housing. to your place on Lexington Avenue, right. I think, for uh, the Hanukkah party all the time. Yeah, everybody's overjoyed right. to be there. So after that, then you did a lot of uh, properties on 3rd Avenue and Lexington Avenue. Right. We, we have a couple of prop projects on 3rd, 27th and 3rd. Uh, Lex and 31st Street. We have some projects. One is on 61st Street or 1st Avenue. We have one on 61st and West End that we did with Atlantic Development. Uh, you know, we're very so what's proud the of largest that. inclusionary housing you have? The largest inclusionary is the one on 61st and West End with Atlantic. It's 119 units. And the qualification is someone has to be 62 or over? 62 or over, and it's uh, approximately 80% of the average median income of the community board that they live in. So there are shifting numbers depending on so what community board. So what could someone, because that one, looking at your website yesterday, you said there, that list somebody can get an apartment. So what's Right. The Their income level basically has to be in the neighborhood of about twenty-five dollars to $30,000 a year, and they would be eligible uh, to apply and, and be selected. Now the interesting thing is besides the, the senior housing, now you've been working and we've been talking this, you and I, for probably the last seven or eight years. I think ironically when you were on my radio show, which was right. the original origins of the Stoller Report, we're talking about Staten Island. Let's talk about Staten Island sure. and what you're doing now in Staten Island. Sure. Uh, you know, we have a presence in Staten Island doing a lot of social services and crisis intervention, uh, but we've always been very anxious to build additional housing there because there is land available. And we have two fascinating projects. One is uh, recently completed that we've done with the Orca Brothers, which is 104 units of independent living senior housing in a renovated building which was known as the old nurse's residence of Seaview Hospital. And it's a magnificently restored building. It's up for a whole bunch of architectural awards and um, has been really dynamic. So explain that program and what the Arcas did with that program. I sure, know, sure. Try the, to understand. Uh, the Arcas uh, teamed with us, and they were able to do the actual renovations and development part, and we're working to uh, make sure that people get the services that they need in the building. And they were able to capture some historic tax credits for this building and the restorations of uh, rooms uh, that you have to walk through to, you know, just to appreciate it. People in the neighborhood have come and taken tours of the building to see 
how beautifully restored the building is. Now, this is assisted living? This is independent living. Independent living. living. So what is independent living? Independent age? living for seniors basically, as someone once described it to me, is kind of like the Grossinger's package. Grossinger's is a former Catskills hotel. You provide people with some entertainment. Well, you still play baseball up in the Catskills. I still play I baseball, but not at Grossinger's. You can't. Um, where basically you provide people with some entertainment, three meals a day, and you turn their linens. In, in, when you get into assisted living, you're now providing Now, let's more, continue sure. independent before we get to assisted. Sure. What age is independent living? Uh, well, different programs have different age levels. For the most part, it's 55 and older. But there are some subsidies in additional programs. In order to get into your program in Staten Island? In Staten Island, you have to be 55 or older. And it's a lottery also? It's not a lottery. That's actually a affordable housing project, but it is a higher income level. What is it, 175 Bavaria median income? Uh, it's, it's a little higher than that, actually, uh, because in, in Staten Island, they were able to come up with a plan that gave a local area preference at a higher percentage of uh, area. So who could get an apartment in the Staten Island? Basically, people who come and are interested in living there and interested in paying uh, you know, it's not the same subsidy that you have. It's in not the paying six hundred dollars. It's not six hundred dollars a so month. So, what does That's somebody right. pay? Uh, they're paying probably between twelve hundred and fifteen hundred dollars a month, which is equivalent to what a one-bedroom apartment might cost somebody in other settings. But here, there are a much better array of services for people, and they can pick off a menu. Do they want the three meals a day? Do they want the linen service? So that's they, additional charges right. also. The basic is twelve hundred dollars, right. and then the additional. And now the second project you're working the on. The second now. project we've been working at for a long time, including a three and a quarter year environmental impact uh, study, uh, is in Staten Island as well, just north of this project, and that this would be new construction of one hundred and fifty units of assisted living, and that will be at a subsidized level. Uh, just to give you an illustration, the current market rate level for assisted living on Staten Island is between five and six thousand dollars a month which includes a lot of personal care we're looking at bringing this in between thirty five hundred to four thousand dollars a month with personal care with the necessity of the three meals and and all the services uh, that somebody needs. And how would somebody qualify for that? The same thing is true here again because we're not talking about a heavily uh, subsidized, subsidized program. project uh, people will have to apply to be on a first-come, first-served basis. There is no income limitation at this particular point, although that could change. The project's not built yet, and you know, so certainly as we move forward in building the project, um, government may come in and say, well, you know, you're going to have such a large demand. We want to impose an income limitation. Or they may say, you know, rent up the project. We want to make sure you rent it up, whatever the incomes are. So we're still working that out with government. Now, uh, you're building, you're planning to build in Queens right now in a right. New York City housing. Right. We're, we're very excited about that. It took us about 10 years to get the housing authority to give us the land on a parking lot at the Pominock Housing Development from the New York City Housing Authority. And they did, and HUD agreed to uh, provide the funding to build about 85 units of senior housing out there. What other projects are on the horizon? Well, in addition to Staten Island, there's another co-op city project uh, that we're going to be building right next door to our first uh, senior housing project in, uh, in the Bronx. And um, we're, we're looking forward to building about 75 units of senior housing there. And again, because it's next door to our first project, we won't have to hire up another site director, but we'll be able to hire new staff that will help take care of the people who are living there. So, for example, there'll probably be a nurse who will be coming in to do a lot more in the way of health care management for these seniors, help them live longer, help them do better nutritional things, take their blood pressure on a regular basis, make sure they're taking the medications they need to take. What's the annual budget of Med Council? Our yeah. annual budget's about $117 million a year. Now, it could be very deceptive because out of that $117 million, $75 million of it is for the Medicaid home care program. Every single day, we have about 3,000 home attendants who go out across the city and take care of over 3,000 senior citizens, people who are homebound, they can't bathe themselves, they can't feed themselves, they can't go out by themselves. So that program is extremely... How um, does someone get into that program? Uh, first, they have to be qualified by Medicaid. Then the City of New York's Human Resources Administration has, um, in each of these communities, people who then screen the people to see what their needs are. They need two hours a day, four hours a day, six hours a day. They will then call agencies like Met Council's home care agency and bring us in to service the population. Generally, there's an attempt to cluster as much so that you make it as efficient as possible. So they will, for example, say to us, we'd like you to work f primarily in southern Brooklyn and central Queens so that we can take care of the populations there. 
So you said 75 million of the 117 million. Where is the, the rest of the budget? Well, the rest of it is in a whole host of areas, which include our food pantry program, career counseling and job training. We're currently training people to become emergency medical technicians, paramedics, and x-ray technicians. Where do you train them? We train them in a variety of places uh, in Brooklyn and in Manhattan. Uh, we're also working on a program with LaGuardia Community College where we'll be uh, working to train uh, more emergency medical technicians. These are places that there are jobs available today for people who may have lost jobs. And there's one case of a guy, Mike, who's a uh, businessman from Brooklyn, and last summer, summer of 2008, was making $200,000 a year. In August, he lost the job and decided, you know, he'd been working real hard for a lot of years, so he decided he's going to take it easy. And as he was taking it easy, he basically watched as his savings and his pension money just disappeared the way of Bear Stearns and, uh, and Lehman Brothers. And then in November, he was offered an $80,000 a year job, and he felt insulted and turned it down. But by January, he was had desperate, no job. had nothing, didn't have any prospects on the horizon. We were doing trainings by last January of 2009 for rabbis and community leaders to outreach to people who needed jobs and who needed help. His rabbi told him to come to us and apply for training as an emergency medical technician. Today, he's a proud emergency medical technician, and he's g gone on TV with me at New York One and other places where he's actually told people to grab the bull by the horns while you still have an option. Don't burn down your savings. Don't take your credit cards and, and use them up, and start That's making cuts. Story. Really compelling. Uh, now, you married for, what, 30? 36 years. 36 years, and you and Judy have three sons. Three sons. Tell me about your sons. Sure, sure. Our oldest, Michael, um, is an attorney, and he's working for Forest City Ratner, working on a couple of projects uh, up in Yonkers and the Upper East Side and doing some mall development there. Uh, our middle son, um, Jonathan, is uh, studying to be a rabbi, which he is going to be getting certification in, in April, but he's also working for a program that helps kids remediate their education so that if in the second and third grade they're not speaking the language at a level that they should be speaking the language, they do additional training and for them. And the baby? And our baby, uh, Mark, is in Israel for the year studying there, and, and we miss him. When, when you and I met, I said, who were your mentors? And I think that you made a great comment about your late mother and father with Chesed. Yes. Um, my parents uh, really raised myself and my, my younger sister to really try to be nice, as, as nice as you can. And they particularly meant uh, with elderly people. Um, they suggested that, number one, if you don't do anything for them, just smile and say hello, goodbye, good morning. And they said it would brighten their day. And I never realized how true that was, um, as I do in this business, because I see so many elderly people, because we do so much work with the elderly. We do work with others as well. Uh, but senior citizens appreciate a kind word more than anything. There is no question, you know, from your roots uh, in the Lower East Side, and you continue to live in the Lower East Side, and following your parents' uh, approach and housing, you've helped the elderly, and you truly are a building New York. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Michael. Major funding for this program is made possible by grants from Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Inc., New York's Window Company, New York Community Bank, Capital One Bank, Greenberg Traurig, LLP. Additional funding is provided by grants from Akron Gold Brothers, LLC, Briarwood Organization, C.B. Richard Ellis, Cushman and Wakefield, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Friedman, LLP, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, M&T Bank, Must Development, LLC, Des Moines Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Orphanides and Associates, SJP Properties, Sterling and Sterling, Stonehenge Partners, Urban American, 
W Financial Mortgage Fund, the Wickoff Group.